Hello, 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 and welcome to COP's online evening service. It's so good to have you with us. This very moment, this time where we get to worship God together, we get to read his word and hear great news from pastor in his sermon. As always, let's start with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. For our praise moment tonight, we are going to Psalm 23, verse... One. We are still on verse 1, but guess what? Tonight, we get to go to the second part of verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That word want, oh, it's a powerful, beautiful word. It means to decrease, to diminish, made lower, fail. Why is it that I said that's a powerful, wonderful word because it says, I shall not. <laughs> if the Lord is my shepherd, I am not shepherdless. If the Lord is your shepherd, you are not shepherdless. You have not been abandoned. You have one who leads you out, who goes before you, who tends to you, who calls you by name, who knows you, and you shall not want. That means you will, as the years go by, a couple of years from now, you are going to look back on this time and you're going to say to yourself, I did not want, meaning I did not decrease, I did not diminish, I did not fail, I did not grow less during this time. Your finances did not fail, your family did not fail, your ability to get wealth did not diminish, because these are things that come to us from the Lord. Amen. Psalm 34 verse 10 tells us that when we belong to the Lord, we lack no good thing. So we do not lack food, we do not lack provision, we do not lack health, we do not lack happiness, no good thing. So are there any bad things that we lack? Sure. We might lack destruction. <laughs> we might lack poverty. We might lack hunger. Oh, yeah. But we lack no good thing. All these good things the Lord knows we have need of. And when he is our shepherd, we shall not want. We shall not lack. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 7, it says, You shall be fruitful and multiply and increase greatly on the earth. I like that verse and I like to apply it to this, I shall not want. Because if we are to increase, which means to bring forth abundantly, 
we do so, it says, on this earth. See, our rewards for serving the Lord, it's not just all in heaven. It's not what they call a pie in the sky, religion or relationship. Our rewards are not just in heaven, but our rewards are only here, are also here on this earth. Also, we greatly increase here on this earth. We and our families will be blessed abundantly here on this earth. And then, of course, when we get to heaven, wow, we get an eternity of awesome rewards. In Psalm 115, verse 14, may the Lord give you increase, both you and your children. That word means more, added, additional, exceed, go further. Okay, so may the Lord make you go further. May the Lord tonight add to you and your family in every way. May the Lord give you more. May the Lord give you additional. May the Lord cause you to exceed and excel. Amen. So hold your head up high and look to the Lord. In this time, you're going to come out of this increased, not decreased. You belong to the shepherd, the good shepherd, and you shall not want. Amen. Now, let's worship the Lord together. Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder. 
Today at COP, are you a Go Group leader who wants to know more about the Word of God? COP's Connect Leaders University, or CLU, meets one evening a week via Zoom to help you learn, grow, and mature in your knowledge of the Word of God. You may speak with your campus pastor to know the details for your particular campus. Today at COP, have you recently held a trio outreach or taken part in a district Zoom crusade? After their first step of obedience to the Lord, which is water baptism, you need to help them grow in their knowledge of the Lord. They will benefit from taking up their levels. Levels 1, 2, 3, and even level 4 leadership block are always available via Zoom in each COP campus. Level 1 is basic, okay, you're saved, here's what you need to know kind of teaching. And Level 1 is required for people to become ministry involved at COP. Level 2 and 3 will help you mature in Christ, while Level 4 prepares you to become a Go Group leader yourself. Not only for new believers, some Christians have been attending church for years but have not found the time to complete their Levels training. Now is the perfect time. Do it as a family. Any one of the COP pastors can help you get plugged into this important training. Today at COP, for all of our beloved seniors, at COP we have a special program for you airing at 9 a.m. daily, Monday through Friday, hosted by Pastor Joey Pagadora, called Senior Moments to Remember. This half-hour program can be seen on Facebook or COP's YouTube channel. It is filled with worship, teaching, and activities geared to this wise stage of life. What a great day we are having at COP! A couple of times a week, we'd like to take you back to the book of Proverbs. This is something we have not been doing in morning devotions, but we're adding it a couple of nights a week to the evening service. Now, Proverbs is this incredible book of wisdom. And the other night, we saw the purpose of Proverbs. Tonight, I want to talk to you about learning. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, where does... Where does knowledge begin? Knowledge begins with respect for God. Now, if you go through the scripture and you study this concept of the fear of God or respect for God, you're going to see that when people lose this, they, they get into a darkened mentality. The, the beginning of learning is to have a respect for God. This is where knowledge begins. But then he takes it a step farther and he said, let me tell you about a fool. A fool despises wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. It's, it's, all right, these are the facts, and then this is what the facts means in our life. Fools despise wisdom, and fools despise instruction in verse 7. It is amazing to me, all through my life, to meet people who don't want to learn. They don't want instruction in their life. They, they think they know it all. In fact, later on in Proverbs, we'll see that a fool thinks he's smarter than everybody around. A fool refuses to accept instruction. A fool refuses to sit down with someone and says, now listen, you know, in light of all this going on, have you considered this, trying to impart a little wisdom? A fool has no desire for that. Now, if you and I want to be a people who are going to learn and grow and change and adapt in this world that we live in, number one, we have to have respect for God. And number two, we should never push away an opportunity to gain wisdom. And we should never push away an opportunity for someone to instruct us. We've been going through some of the more complicated parts of the book of Romans, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9. Now, to this point, we learned all the purposes of the law. Well, a lot of the purposes of the law thus far. And now we've gotten to chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only to a person who is still living? Let me illustrate. When a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So this is the point. 
The law no longer holds you in its power because you died to its power when you died to Christ on the cross. But now that you are united with the one who was raised from the dead, as a result, you can produce good fruit, that is, good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old sinful nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced sinful deeds resulting in death. But now that we have been released from the law, for we died with Christ, and we are no longer captive to his power, now we can really serve God, not in the old way by obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way by the Spirit. Well then, am I suggesting that all the law of God is evil? Of course not. The law is not sinful. But it was the law that showed me my sin. I could never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin took advantage of this law and aroused all kinds of forbidden desires within me. If there was no law, sin would not have power. I felt fine then when I did not understand what the law demanded. But when I learned the truth, I realized I had broken the law and was a sinner, doomed to die. So the good law, which was supposed to show me the way of life, instead gave me the death penalty. Sin took advantage of the law and fooled me. It took the good law and used it to make me guilty of death. So then, the law in itself is holy and right and good. And how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my doom? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commandment for its own evil purposes. The law is good then. The trouble is not with the law, but with me, because I am sold into slavery, with sin as my master. I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well that what I am doing is wrong, and my bad conscience shows that I agree that the law is good. But I can't help myself, because it is sin inside me that makes me do these th evil things. I know that I am rotten through and through so far as my old sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. But if I am doing what I do not want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. The sin within me is doing it. In fact, it seems to be a fact of life that when I do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another law at work within me that is at work within my mind. This law fights, wins the fight and makes me slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? Thank God. The answer is in Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of the sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Now, as we began to walk through this very difficult passage, we began to learn the authority of the law. We saw that Paul addresses his Christian brothers that this is something that we all know. We know that all men are born under the law. We learned that we got set free from the law, not by rebellion, but we got set free from the law by Jesus Christ. We saw that when we got saved, our, our relationship with the law changed. Now, this is going to be important to remember for our study tonight. In verse 5 says, the sinful passions were aroused by the law so that we bore fruit to death. He said, now, now this was before, but he said, things are different now. Verse 6, but now we have been released from the law. When we got born again, when we died with Christ, we died to the law. The law no longer has authority over us. He said, but now that we have been released from the law, for we died with Christ, and we're no longer captive to its power, now we can really serve God. Not in the old way. Now here's a key to understanding this whole passage. Not in the old way by obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way by the Spirit. Now, as we progressed through this, we began to understand the character of the law, that since we have been deceived, we need to understand the true character of the law. The law is not sin. The law is holy, righteous, good, and spiritual. And its purpose was to reveal sin, and this purpose was intended to bring life. That was the true character of the law. Now, the law was used in a manipulated, deceitful fashion, and so Paul begins to tell the story of his really his spiritual life. 
We saw Paul in his age of innocence. He said, listen, now before, before I knew the difference between right and wrong, and we taught you out of the book of Isaiah the other night, he said, we, we saw Paul in his age of innocence. And then when he began to learn right and wrong, the law just brought to fruition all of this, this domination in his life. But we saw that Paul had sin enter into his life and aroused his desire for sin. Now, I want us to take us a step farther. This was Paul's early life. Now let's take it into Paul's early spiritual born-again life as we begin to understand the doctrine of legalism versus life in the Spirit. Now this is very important for us to understand because Paul here is chronicling for us his, his spiritual journey. The season when he did not know the law, in his age of innocence, he didn't know right and wrong, to a season later when he's born again, but he's still trying to live the way he used to live, and he didn't understand yet freedom in the Spirit. Now, in, in the last verse of Romans 7, we, we clearly understand what Paul is saying about all of this. He says, thank God. He said, who set me free? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, now, now this is something that you all have to understand. He said, we, we've been set free from this. But Paul had to go through a second step. Paul was a man who had been raised his whole life in the law. And when Paul first got born again, he served God the only way he knew to serve God, obeying the legalism of the law. Now, if you look at verse 6, it says, But now, by dying to that which once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. And we get over to chapter 8, Paul deals with this whole concept of overcoming the sinful nature by living by the Spirit. But Paul takes us from his pre-innocence days to his salvation days, just early born again days and he's only serving God in the way he knew. Just like you and I when we first got born again we, we did what we knew to do but we, but we didn't know much. He was, he was a born again Christian living in legalism. Now as you begin to understand this progress in Paul's life we, we are reminded that all of Christianity is a series of progressions. Philippians 3 verse 12 said, not that I've already obtained this or have already been made perfect. He said, but I press on to take hold of for that which Christ has taken hold of me. Now, in Paul's early days of salvation, he followed Jesus and he loved Jesus, but he still loves the law of God and he's still committed to the law of God. Now again, put that together with what we learned in the book of Acts. I think it's around chapter 21, 22 in Acts. Do you remember when Paul went up to Jerusalem on that last trip? And he sat down with James, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he told James all of the great things about the Gentiles' salvation. And James was very happy. And James says, we have thousands of people here who have also followed Christ. And they are all devoted to the law. And you notice how much trouble Paul got in right after that. Christians cannot live with a devotion to the law. We died to the law. But Paul understood this, so he didn't fight with these people. Paul understood this. They're serving the only way they understand right now. They've been raised their whole life in, in legalistic Judaism. So now they've added salvation in, in Jesus to that, but they haven't yet learned the new way of the Spirit. And this is what we're going to see as we go through the rest of chapter 7 and we get over into chapter 8. Now let's start tonight by looking at the characteristics of what I call miserable, legalistic Christianity. Romans chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. Paul said, I know that nothing good lives in me. He's talking autobiographically here about his life as a baby Christian. That is in my sinful nature. He said, for I have a desire to do good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I want to do, do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now notice. He said, for the desire I have to do that which is good. The Greek word there, thelo, means to be constantly desirous. Paul was constantly desirous of doing the will of God as a baby Christian. His desires had changed. Unfortunately, that sinful nature that had been unplugged at salvation 
as soon as he gets back into the law again, the law arouses that sinful nature again. Now, remember, Paul said, in my innocence, the sinful nature didn't, didn't give me that much trouble. But as soon as the law came in, he said it aroused, it, it brought to, to fruition and fruit the sinful nature. Now again, a baby Christian can start in their salvation. The sinful nature is disconnected, as we've talked about earlier, and we'll get more into in chapter 8. The sinful nature was disconnected. Now we still have the ability to sin, but we don't have that sinful nature controlling us anymore. And we've died to the sinful nature, and we've died to the law. But Paul said, you know what? I went right back into the law. I went right back into trying to serve God in the old way and not the new way in the spirit. As he says in verse 6, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. He said, I went right back into that old way of the written code. He said, I, I'm born again, but when I started trying to serve in the, in the way of the law that I died to, again, the law aroused all that sinful passion. The sinful, the sinful nature began to manipulate and misuse the law again. So Paul, as a legalistic Christian, is what we would call a carnal Christian. Now, he uses three words to describe mankind in his writings. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he describes the sukios man, or the natural man. He's very clear. He said, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This, this is the natural man, the sukios man. And then he describes the pneumaticos man, also in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, but as worldly, as carnal, as mere infants in Christ. Now, the word carnal is sarkios. Sarkios is a man who is saved, who has not found deliverance from the power of sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, the Sarkios man, the carnal Christian, is a man who has found deliverance in Christ, but he's not yet discovered deliverance from the power of sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's still under that control of the sinful nature. Now, Paul describes this legalistic Christian as being carnal. He said, the problem is not with my desire to do what's right. He said, it's with my inability to do what's right. Now, you need to get a hold of that. The problem was not with Paul's desire. He said, when I was a legalistic Christian, the problem was not with my desire. The problem was with my inability to do what is right because he's trying to do it in his own strength, just like he had done for a lifetime. Now think with me, how many times here in Romans chapter 7, in that hard passage, I don't understand what to do for I want to do what I do not want to do, but I hate what I do. I, I. How many times does he use the word I? It's all about his human efforts. See, that, that's legalism. Legalism is all about your human efforts trying to do what is right and obey God. And so it's all about I, 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 I. It's not about freedom in the spirit. It's all about I. So the carnal Christian is attempting by their own human effort to live right. Now, they've been saved. Their desires are right. Their, their heart has been changed. But they have an inability to live right because they're trying to do this in the old way of the letter, as Paul says. So the carnal Christian has not yet learned deliverance that comes from a life of living in the Spirit. The, car the carnal legalistic Christian is still under the bondage of sin. Romans 7, verse 14, he said, We know that the law is spiritual, but I, he said, I am unspiritual. He said, I, I'm not a spiritual man. I'm not a pneumaticos man. He said, I, I'm a sarkios man. He said, I am unspiritual. <laughs> He's talking about an earlier stage in his life, sold as a slave to the sinful nature. He's yielded back to that situation, trying to do things in his old strength. Now, Paul recognized that there is nothing good in the sinful nature. In verse chapter 7, verse 18, he said, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. He said, I have a desire to do what is good. I've been born again. My heart has been changed. He said, but I cannot carry it out. He said, this, this legalism, this trying to serve God in my own strength, in my own ability, in my own willpower to obey the law, 
He said, that thing has awakened that sinful nature in me again. Verse 17, Paul said, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin or the sinful nature living in me. Verse 20, no, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sinful nature living in me that does it. Now, every believer has a sinful nature. I mean, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, we'll, we'll get more into this in chapter 8, but it, it's kind of like, and this is a very poor description of it. The sinful nature is like a part of your brain that just gets unplugged. Okay, it's just, it's, it's, it's there, but it's dormant. The thing that brings it alive, as we saw earlier this week, the thing that brings it alive, that arouses it, is the law. It's trying to be right in your own strength. And that arouses it and it misuses the commandments of God and deceives us and, and makes us fall. He said, listen, all of us have that sinful nature in us. We just need to keep it unplugged. Paul said, listen, it's still very much alive. Verse 17, is, he said, but the sinful nature living in me. Now, how does the sinful nature get back in control? Well, the carnal legalistic believer, and this is what Paul said, I'm not spiritual. He said, I'm unspiritual. He said, I'm not a, I'm not a pneumaticos man. I'm not living by the spirit man. I'm a, I'm a carnal man. The carnal legalistic believer believes that the law is spiritual. Okay, verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual. The carnal legalistic believer believes and agrees that the law is good. Verse 17, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. But the carnal legalistic believer is still a slave to the law. Now look at verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. No, we're not. We died to the law. See, this is Paul's early days of salvation. I am a slave to God's law. But in the sinful nature, I am a slave to the law of sin. Now, brothers and sisters, Paul did not yet understand in these in this early days of his Christianity what it meant to be free from the law, what it meant to be released from the law, what it meant to have died to the law, what it meant to be, be living in a life of the Spirit. And I sometimes wonder how long this took him to get a hold of this. Now we know that he went for three years in the deserts of Arabia. And there he met with Jesus face to face and Jesus taught him the gospel. And maybe this is why when Paul comes back, he said, you know what? I wasn't a halfway Jew. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But he said, you know what? After Jesus got a hold of me and changed me, I understand it's not about I, 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 I. It's not about serving in the old way of the Spirit. It's not about, okay, I'm saved, but now I have to do a better job of obeying the law. He said, it's about being set free in the Spirit. Now, this brings us to what I call the schiz schizophrenic nature of a legalistic believer. Now, schizophrenic, we all understand, it's like, my goodness, they have two totally different brains, okay? It's, it's like a, a dual-faceted personality. It's like multiple personality disorder in a Christian. The basic problem of a legalistic believer is they cannot live the way they want to live. The legalistic believer always acts like what they do not want to act. Verse 15 and 16, he said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Verse 18, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, and the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sinful nature that is living within me that does it. Grave telega. He feels like a, a, a multiple personality <laughs> disorder person. The legalistic believer attempting to live in their own strength, not by the power of the Spirit, can never live right. Let me say that again. The legalistic believer, the believer who's still trying to obey the law, to do the right things in their own strength, will never, and not by the power of the Holy Spirit, will never be able to live right. The legalistic believer is depending upon themselves 
and depending upon the law of God, and they're not depending on the Holy Spirit. Now, the basic problem of a legalistic believer is this thing called another law. Verse 23. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my body. There's another set of authorities in a legalistic believer that controls the interaction between the law and the sinful nature. Let me say that again. In a legalistic believer, there is another law. There's another authority. There's another set of principles that control the interaction between the law and the sinful nature. Now look at verse 22 and 23 with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my bodies. Now, folks, we know that the law is good. We know that the law of the sinful nature seeks to control us. But now there's the law of legalism. And the law of legalism releases the law back into the sinful nature, which strengthens it and plugs it back into control and puts it back in charge of a legalistic Christian, returns us to the state of being a prisoner. So we have the law of God, we have the sinful nature, and now we have this third thing, another law. This is the law of legalism. Where, okay, I'm a Christian, but I have to serve God in the old way of the, of the letter. And so this new law at work plugs the law and the sinful nature back in together, and we're right back in almost the same situation as we were before. Do I think these people are born again? Yes. Do I think these people are going to heaven? Yes. Do I think these people are miserable Christians? <laughs> Most certainly yes. You and I must understand that everything we have learned about the interaction between the law and the sinful nature continues to be true in the life of a believer. Let me say that again. Everything we have learned about the interaction between the law and the sinful nature, how the sinful nature manipulates and uses the law and deceives us, all of that is still true in the life of a believer. And if we are trying to live according to the law, the law will still be used by the sinful nature to stimulate sin within our lives, to control us, and dominate us. It is the spirit that sets us free, not the law. It is the spirit that sets us free, not the law. That's why all of chapter 8 we're going to talk about this new life in the spirit. Now Paul describes this legalistic, law-driven state of Christianity as wretched. He said, what a wretched man am I, verse 24. And wretched literally means to be wretched to the point of exhaustion of hard labor. Paul said, you know what? It's really, really hard work. It's a wearying thing as a Christian to try to live my life in accordance with the law by my own strength and by my own ability. He said, it is an exhausting, exhausting thing. He said, well, pastor, what, what hope is there for a legalistic Christian? <laughs> Who will rescue me from this body of death? Verse 24. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now if you're listening to me today and I have described your spiritual life, there's no joy, there's no freedom. You're, you're always sinning and you don't even want to sin. And the things that you want to do, you're not doing. And you just feel helpless to really live the Christian life. Do I doubt your salvation? No. But you haven't learned that you, you don't do this in your own strength and ability. You died to sin and you died to the law. Just like I taught you that you had to consider yourself dead to sin, you had to consider yourself dead to the law. You, you cannot obey the law in your own strength, but you can obey God in this new way of the Spirit. And that is what we're going to get into tomorrow night. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerl of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Somerl every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. 
We have a Saturday online special service at 7 p.m. at this social media page. Our drive-in service is available for booking and happens every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. at our COP Main and South Campus parking lots. Fortress 91 is from Tuesday to Sunday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. in all Cathedral Place campuses. For more information, booking reservations, and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.